seniors for leading us uh, today in worship on this Senior Adult Sunday. Um, when I was little, my favorite toy, uh, they, they were Legos, and I had a ton of Legos, and I had uh, all sorts of different uh, pieces individually, but then a, a ton of different sets. Uh, if you're familiar with Legos, I, I used to collect what was uh, part of what they called the town system, and so I had, I had a motorcycle shop and a gas station, um, I had an airport, I had an office building, had uh, fire trucks and all kinds of other little, uh, little pieces. Uh, the, the thing, though, that I, I had the most of, though, were police sets. I loved police stuff. And so I had a ton of police cars. I had police motorcycles. I had a police uh, helicopter. I had a paddy wagon. I had all kinds of stuff. But the thing that, that I was so grateful to have and most grateful to have was the police headquarters. And I remember I got that one year for Christmas, and I remember being so profoundly excited that Christmas morning when, when I wake up and discover that I have gotten this this uh, police headquarters set. And it was a big set. I don't know how many pieces, well over a thousand. And uh, it, it's going to take a while to put together. In fact, I, I spent, apart from playing with some toys and stopping for lunch or playing with some other toys every once in a while, um, it took me from that morning until just before supper that night to, to be able to, to get this big set together. If you've never put Legos together, it's pretty simple, though. They, they come with an instruction book that has uh, every single step, and in each step, there's a few pieces, no more typically than just a couple, that they'll show adding this to this to this to this, and bit by bit, keep turning pages, do each of these steps, and you've got this together. Anyway, so I have been working for hours to put together this police headquarters, and finally, I, 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 I can see the end of the tunnel. There's light at the end of the tunnel. I am, I'm almost done. And then finally I finish, and I'm so excited because instead of just putting this together, I can actually play with it. Everything is perfect, almost. I've got probably 20 or 25 parts, pieces, that are still sitting on the floor. And my question is, wonder where those go. <laughs> wonder what you do with those. I wonder... I wonder where they're supposed to be. Or, or no, maybe these are just extra pieces. Then very quickly, their presence answered another question for me, which is this. Why does the top not fit together very well? At that point, I discovered this about Legos. There are not extra pieces. Each of them is necessary and important. Each of them is necessary and important. Hold that thought for just a moment, though. We've been, over the, the past number of weeks, in a series that I've called Outcast. And what we have been, and even today, are looking at are uh, encounters where Jesus dealt with people or had encounters with people that other folks weren't paying any attention to, that were either they felt like or were made to feel like an outcast. They're not kind of in the, in the crowd. They're operating on the outskirts of society. On this senior adult day, one of two things is true. You are either here today as a senior or you hope to live long enough to be one, right? So at the end of the day, this whole senior concept is something that should apply to each of us. You are either already there or hope one day to be able to get there. But one of the challenges that can be experienced, and some of you may say, I have felt this way, not simply in life, but even as a part of the family of God, I kind of feel like an extra piece. I can't do much. I, I used to be connected and committed and involved, but, but now I just kind of feel like an extra piece. But the truth is this. As is the case with Lego sets, so too it is as part of life in the family of God. There aren't extra pieces. Every piece is necessary and important. And we see in part that as Jesus has an encounter with what is the only recorded example for us between Jesus and someone that is absolutely known to be a senior. Look with me in your Bibles today to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and when you hear that, you're probably thinking, okay, we're going to talk about the Christmas story because that's, that's how Luke 2 begins. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. We're familiar with that. 
That's how Luke 2 begins. We're going to start actually at verse 36, though. And just to set the stage for you, what is going on is this. Jesus has been born. By the time you get to verse 22, Jesus is eight days old. And on the eighth day, Jesus, as a Jewish male, was going to be taken to the temple where, uh, among other things, he was to be circumcised and formally he was to get a name. Uh, that you would not name a child until the eighth day. And so that is going to be happening as Jesus is formally consecrated at the temple. So Mary and Joseph take, Joseph take the baby Jesus to the temple on that day. And Luke gives us some backstory where he introduces us to another individual whose name is Simeon. Simeon, context, suggests to us that maybe he is older but we don't know we kind of guess you can surmise that but we don't know that for sure all we know is that Simeon is somebody that knows and walks with God he's described as being just and devout and we're told this about him that God had confirmed to him that he would not die that he would not taste death until as the passage said he had seen the Lord's Christ So God has shown Simeon you're not going to die until you have seen with your own eyes the Messiah Mary and Joseph come that day with the baby Jesus and God prompts Simeon with this thought, that's him. And so Simeon goes over and has this encounter with Jesus, takes him, raises him up and declares to the Lord, now my eye, behold now, Lord, you're letting your servant depart in peace because my eyes have seen your salvation. That has just happened and then we're told this starting in verse 36. There was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years, having lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin, and then as a widow until she was 84. She did not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. All right, so we're introduced then at this point to Anna. There's a few things that we know about Anna based on this, a few things about which we've got some question, one of which is out of the gate she's described as a prophetess. What exactly does that mean? Is this a specific function? Is this uh, like an office to which God has called her to? Or is it because the word means messenger of God that that's describing how she is operating in this passage as a messenger, as a mouthpiece of God? We don't know. But certainly she is in this passage a messenger, a mouthpiece of God. Beyond that, we're told about Anna, something about her Heritage. She's the daughter of a man named Faneuil. She's from the tribe of Asher. Beyond that, we're told she is advanced in years. Now, the ESV says that she's lived with her husband seven years from when she was a virgin and then as a widow until she was 84. Now, th- that's how the ESV renders this, and that there's a little bit of speculation as to what the appropriate way to describe and render these numbers actually is. There's one of two possibilities. We don't know when she got married, but when, from the time she got married, she was married to her husband for seven years. At that point, she is a widow and does not remarry. The ESV says until she's 84, which is when, how old she would have been at this passage. It's also equally possible from the translation to say that she's been a widow for 84 years. That would put her over 100. Over 100 is old. 84 is not a spring chicken either, right? So at at the very least, Anna is 84 years old. Now, we're told also about her, and this is about something about which in this little detail is there's a little bit of, of uncertainty as to what exactly this means, that she did not depart from the temple. And so that means one of two things. Either it's a euphemism to say that she's always, to use our phrase, always at church, night and day so morning prayers and evening prayers she's always there it could mean that or it could possibly mean this the temple complex was a sprawling complex and there was some housing located there and this elderly widow it's possible that they had and that the religious leaders had allowed her to live in like a little apartment there where she could be taken care of that's possible as well we don't know for certain 
But what occurs is that she is at the temple as Jesus is brought, has this encounter with Samuel, and then, or excuse me, with Simeon, and then we're told that she seemingly has this encounter as she comes up at that very hour and she begins to give thanks to God to speak of him to everybody who was waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. So she's at the temple that day and she starts telling people about Jesus to anyone who is waiting for the redemption of Jerusalem. That's almost codified language to say this. She's telling anybody who's interested or thinking about the Messiah, I have seen him. It's, it's this baby that came to the temple today, yesterday, the day before, I, I have seen him. You say, okay, Michael, that's, that's kind of nice. That's interesting. Um, this is the only example in the New Testament where there is an encounter between an individual and Jesus and we know exactly how old the person is and specifically in this case that it's a senior adult at least 84 years old so what what does this have to do with us apart from just telling us a nice story I think there's some application for each of us because as I said earlier we are each either a senior or hopefully living long enough to become one with that in mind, there's a couple of truths based on this that I think are encouraging. And the first is this. You can hear even if you can't hear well. You can hear even if you cannot hear well. What, 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 is that, what does that mean? Well, what's going on at this passage is that Anna is present as Jesus is being presented. And there's this other person, Simeon, who possibly is a senior, who likely is a senior. And we don't know how close she is to what's going on. Luke doesn't seem to indicate that she's standing right there with Simeon, with Mary and Joseph and Jesus. Maybe she's a little further off to the side. We, we don't know. But if she were right there, you would think that Luke would have, have said she was right there and is participating in this. So how close was she? Did she hear what Simeon said? Well, well, well quite frankly, we, we don't know. She is present there, at least in proximity, as Simeon offers at the very least a very thinly veiled statement concerning Jesus as being the Messiah. He blesses the baby Jesus, but what does Anna do? She starts to praise God and tell everybody about Jesus. Here's the question. How does she know? How does she know? Why does she do this? Did she hear what Simeon said? Was she close enough? Was she right there immediately as part of the context? Was she able to overhear what was being said, and then at that point is able to go and share and tell people about what she has been able to experience. Was she able to overhear, and because of that, then be able to praise God? I, I really don't think so. Again, I don't think she was close enough, but the other thing is this. She's 84 years old. I know what it's like to be 42. That's all I know from personal experience, but through observation, I've come to discover this, and some of you can attest to this. Your hearing at 84 is not like it was at 44. True or false? Or me, let me say it again. Your hearing at 84... No. Um. <laughs> Our hearing over time doesn't get better. At 84, at the very least, she's not hearing like she used to. I don't think she's close enough. So how is it that she was able to hear this? Well... Either she was close enough, which I don't think so, or something else happened. There's another way that she was able to figure this out. My explanation is this. The Lord told her and said to Anna, that's the one. I don't think she could hear Simeon speak. I don't think she was close enough. But I think she could hear the Lord speak. I don't think she was close enough by virtue of proximity or by age to hear what Simeon said. But regardless of her age, she was able to hear what the Lord said. Because you can hear 
even if you can't hear well. My mom's mother lived with us from 1988 until her death in 2008. Uh, when she was uh, just over 92 years old. You've heard me mention her before. I, I, my nickname for her was Charles. And Charles, uh, I think she was, about, she was about 72 when she moved in with us. And at 72, her, her hearing wasn't great. But over the next 20 years, it got significantly worse to the point where she could hardly hear a gun go off. I mean, it was, that was the truth. And even after she got hearing aids, it was still very difficult. Uh, my parents have a, have a split-level house. And most of the time, Charles, she would like to watch TV in the, at the middle level. That's where the living room was because she wanted to watch stuff that nobody else did. And so she's, she's sitting up there in the living room with the TV on, especially in the summertime, break games if you wanted to watch something different downstairs you might as well give it up because the tv was so blessed loud coming from upstairs you might as well watch the braves game because you're going to hear it whether you want to or not in fact this is no joke she literally blew the speakers out on the tv it was so blessed loud Charles could not hear a gun go off, it seemed. And conversation with her was not particularly easy. And you just had to tell yourself, whatever I say to her, I'm going to say at least twice, maybe three or four times. Unless you were saying something negative. (laughs) If I were to gripe about Charles to Christy, my sister, or to my mom or dad... If anybody was to say something negative about something that Charles did, it was like, praise Jesus, a miracle has occurred. (laughs) She heard it. How can you can't hear a cannon go off in the bathroom? And well, that's not the best way to describe that. Um, didn't write that one down (laughs) you can't hear a gun go off but somebody has said something remotely negative about something that you have done and strangely you're able to hear this and my mom's statement was this I know her hearing's not good but I still think she hears what she wants to hear you ever heard that statement You might have used that statement before. And to the extent that that's true physically, I don't know. But I do believe, relative to spiritual things, it is true. In this perspective, if you want to hear from the Lord, you can hear from Him. If you want God to speak, and if you want to be able to hear Him, it is something that is possible Jesus put it this way in John chapter 10 verse 27 my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me if you never hear from him it's because not of a deficiency in your physical hearing capacity it's because of one of two other things you are either not yet one of his sheep you've yet to begin a personal relationship with him or secondly it's you don't hear from him because you are not seeking to listen to his voice. After all, regardless of your age, you can hear even if you can't hear well. But there's another encouraging application, which is this. You can do even if you can't do much. You can do even if you can't do much. Have you considered what it is that gets in the news some of you may very quickly respond well what gets in the news is it, it, it's negative it's a shooting stabbing or a murder right well, the, the, that gets in the news when I, I suppose that's true because you do hear a, a, lot, a lot about that in the news a lot of, a lot, a lot of negative stuff but at the end of the day what I would want you to note is this what gets into the news whether that's on local TV or national TV or local news, local newspaper is stuff that's unusual that's out of the ordinary For, let me give you an example, you say what's well, it's just negative stuff, it's people getting killed all the time alright, last year in the city of Greensboro there were 43 murders 43 murders and, and hear me in this, every murder if it's one, is one murder too many right, but that's 43 murders in a city whose population, city limits 282,000 people 
If my math is correct, 43 murders out of 282,000 people is a murder rate of 0.015%. Slightly over one one hundredth of a percent. Every eight and a half days, not even every week, so every eight and a half days, someone was murdered in the city limits of Greensboro. Again, one is too many, but it doesn't happen every day. Less than one, one, or slightly over one one hundredth of one percent is the murder rate. And yet, it gets on the news. It's going to be written about in the newspaper. Why? Well, it's because it's out of the ordinary. It doesn't happen every day. There's not 100,000 of them. There's, there's 43 of them. What gets into the news are the things that happen out of the ordinary. Just yesterday, I read a news story online, and this was the headline. Twin sisters celebrate turning 100 with flower-filled photo shoot. I was glad it did not say twin sisters celebrate turning 100 with bikini spread for Sports Illustrated. But it said uh, twin sisters celebrate turning 100 with flower-filled photo shoot. That caught my attention, but why, why does it catch my attention? So some, some people had birthdays. We all have birthdays. You've had at least one, right? You live long enough, you can have another one, and hopefully another one, another one, another one. We, we all have birthdays. Twins also have birthdays, just like everybody else. I know there's not as many twins as there are every other person, just single births. But, you know, twins aren't particularly uncommon. So why is this a news story? It's not because people have birthdays because all people have birthdays it's not because twins had a birthday because all twins have birthdays why, why this became a story is because it's unusual because it's kind of unusual still for anybody to get to be 100 years old and it's even more unusual to find a set of twins where both twins have lived to see their 100th birthday this gets in the news because it is out of the ordinary it is unusual in fact, you have probably noticed this, that the older an individual gets and the longer that a person lives, the more that anything they do becomes noteworthy. And I don't mean that in jest, I mean that in all seriousness. For example, there are not news stories about a 25-year-old running a marathon, Right? But if that's an 80-year-old running a marathon, there's going to be a news story, right? Because that is out of the ordinary. In fact, that's premised on the notion that the older a person gets, the less that they not simply are able to do, but even the less that they then actually do. Again, I'm 42 years old at this point and I hope, live long, hope to live long enough to be able to describe this from personal experience but those of you who are further down the road than I am can speak from your own personal experience that the older you get the less you're able to do and those things that you're still able to do oftentimes those things hurt and so you're prone not to do those either and that type of experience can lead people to say things like this I don't know why I'm still here I can't do anything more specifically, you can have those that are followers of Jesus. And I have heard this, even from people who are here at this church or who now or were a part of this church or now in the Lord's presence, but to say things like this. I just don't know why God still has me here. I, I used to do and serve, but now I, I can't do any of that, and I don't know why God still even has me here. Some of you would say today, I, I have thought about that. I have asked that question. But the good news is this. You can do even if and when you can't do much. Anna is at least 84 years old. She may be over 100 years old. And Luke gives us 
a portrait of what her days look like. It's not simply possible, it's likely that she is at the temple, that she's at church every day. You know why? Because she lives there. And she can't go anywhere else. And Luke doesn't tell us that she's got a garden and she's plowing fields. Doesn't say that she's running a stand at the market. Doesn't say that she is uh, training animals. It doesn't say that she's cleaning house. Doesn't say that she's doing anything except this. She maintains her relationship with God by worshiping him, praying and fasting. And then there's one other thing she does. She tells people about Jesus. I don't think those other things I've just listed, I don't think Anna could do those things. There's probably much that she would have said, I can't do that. But the things that she could do, maintaining her relationship with the Lord and telling other people about Jesus, that she did. So you can do even when and if you can't do much. Some of you are aware of the fact that Glenda Stafford is at this point, and it is possible that she might have even passed while we're gathered here this morning but she and her husband Glenn they've been married for 61 years she's been fighting a long battle with Parkinson's disease and is at the very end of this fight I was with Glenn over uh, at the nursing home till late on on Friday night and she was unresponsive Um, in fact I'm surprised that she actually made it through Friday night Um, not able to communicate with us hardly breathing at all long spans in between these breaths and so Glenn and I are just sitting there and he starts talking about some of the, his memories with Glenda and he says this and she's been over in the nursing home now for a while and interestingly and, and there was so much that Glenda could not do she couldn't get up and walk she was effectively confined either to the bed or to a wheelchair but he started talking about the number of people that there even in the nursing home that she had been talking to Jesus about she couldn't go to Walmart. She couldn't dig any ditches. She's not going to Carowinds. She's not going on a mission trip. She's not doing anything. She's kind of just stuck there. But where she is, she's telling people about Jesus. You know what that says to me? You can do even if you can't do much. I understand that our bodies do not strengthen with age. And there is much that over time we physically lose the ability to do. But this fact remains. If you're a follower of Christ who takes that relationship with the Lord seriously, even when you can't do much, there's a couple of things that you can keep doing until he calls you home. And that's to maintain a relationship with him. And everyone that encounters you is somebody that you can point in his direction. Anna is a woman about whom we know very little. In fact, all we know are verses 36 through 38 of Luke chapter 2. That's it. What's amazing to me, though, is this. For the past 2,000 years, people have been reading about this woman. And you know what's even more interesting to me? They're not reading about what Anna did as a young woman. They're not reading about what Anna did as a 24-year-old, a 34-year-old even a 54-year-old. They're reading about what she did as at least an 84-year-old. There was much that she could not do, but that that she could, she was still doing, and even to the very end, she is pointing people in Jesus' direction. The simple encouragement is this. The God who used Anna wants to use you and wants to use me, but it's up to you. With Lego sets, there's not extra pieces. Every piece is necessary and important. In life in general, and life in the kingdom, and life as part of the church, there are no people that are extra pieces. Every piece is necessary and important because every piece is one that God can still use. Will you bow your heads with me? Everybody here today is 
got some age that describes how long they've been here on this earth. Some of us have been on this earth longer than others. We've got different stories, different backgrounds, different experiences. But at the end of the day, we're all just people. Every one of us, we're just all people. And about all people, it's true that they matter to God. Jesus didn't die for some people. He died for all people. And that includes you. Do you, do, do you. Have you responded to that fact? Have you ever, because of what Jesus has done, made the decision to have a personal relationship with him? If not, we want to say today, we, we want to share with you and point you in his direction and share with you how you can have a relationship like Calvin was able to describe that has changed his life. Maybe you're here today and say, Michael, I, I crossed that bridge a long time ago. But what you said to me is, um, it's encouraging because lately I've, I've been really thinking, I, I don't know why God still has me here. In fact, some days I wake up almost discouraged that I open my eyes. So what I need some help with is for the Lord to help me with my perspective so that I cannot simply know but live on, based on the fact that I can still hear him speak even if I can't hear what others are saying. And I can still be used by him if there's so still much that I cannot do. Maybe you're here as a younger person. You say, you know what? I, I know that you don't wind up at destinations by chance. Every destination has a road, a path that leads to it. Anna did not wind up at this state at 84 years old because of a last-minute correction. It's because this is a woman that walked with God for a long time. Maybe you want your life to be one that at 84 years old, even in the smallest of ways, God is able to use you. There's got to be some course correction now. I don't know what that is, but I think God can even right now be showing you what it is. The question is, will you follow it? Maybe this is the place that God's leading you to invest your life to become a part of this church family. Well, t today's your day. Just a moment, won't you come? Lord, we just want to say thank you for this encouraging word from your word. Because in truth, as I said, and it's not particularly profound, but every one of us is either a senior or we hope to live it long enough to become one. And it's important for us to know now, to understand later, that we're not going to be, and you don't view us as extra pieces. You view us as pieces that are necessary and important and can be and should be used. And so, Lord, as you're speaking to us about changes that we need to make, things that we need to talk to.